let's move then to our third speaker, uh, Ron McNaughton. He'll talk to us about weighing the earth two and a half centuries ago. I am so fascinated with how astronomers could do really accurate measures along measurements a long, long time ago. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, two Peter McNaughtons. Uh, one of them is my brother who has given me incredible help with the research. And the other is a direct ancestor who moved to Canada in the 1820s, who was born near the mountain. So uh, there's a bit of a connection here. Um, there are a number of themes that I'll be talking about. One is the shoulders of giants that the um, uh, very uh, great scientists have led the uh, groundwork for this experiment. There are also changes in technology and London was one of the best places in the world for designing equipment and things, uh, telescopes, and the hardship that was endured by astronomers trying to work things out. So I'm going to start with a giant, and this is a picture by Roy Bishop from the uh, Halifax Center of his home. And he was very involved, uh, Newton was very involved in optics, um, and he uh, did experiments with uh, rainbows and found you can break light into white light into colors with a prism. And then he found a second prism, you can put it back together again, which surprised many people. He did lots of experiments with alchemy to create uh, gold out of other elements. And he ended up running the Royal Mint, including doing some undercover work to catch people. And of course, there's an apple tree in this photo as well. And we've all heard of the apple incident, although it didn't land on his head. Uh, he told several people the apple story. Uh, his niece, he said, it's the apple falling that first got me thinking about gravitation. He was studying physics at the time, and it was uh, Aristotelian physics. Uh, he saw an apple fall and wondered why it fell towards the Earth's center. He told the person that took over from him running the Royal Mint. And another person he told, if that force reached the apple, could it have reached the moon? And that was his niece's husband where he was living together. Um, Definitely, he told these stories. These were near the end of his life. He often had people that questioned his uh, primacy of discovery. And he also had mercury poisoning from his experiments. So I don't know, but I think it's pretty clear. So what was known then? The radius of the Earth was figured out about 250 before the Common Era. 400 years after that, Ptolemy figured out um, how far the moon was away at about 60 Earth radii. The acceleration due to gravity was measured, Galileo and others. Galileo did a lot of experiments with ramps, um, and I couldn't exactly work it out. Now, I mention that because in Newton's wondering if the force of the apple could make the moon go around the Earth, he actually calculated what the gravity would be at that distance, and it turns out it's 1 60th of the gravity at the Earth's surface. And he wondered, maybe the gravity force drops as one over the square of the distance. So Newton uh, did, uh, often did not publish discoveries. And once uh, Edmund Haley came to visit and said, well, somebody wondered about a one over distance squared uh, pattern. And uh, would you be able to calculate what the path of the orbit would be? And Newton said, oh, I've already done that. And he was fiddling around with a bunch of papers. And then uh, he said, I can't find it. And a few days later, he recalculated it. And um, uh, eventually, he put all that into Principia at age 44. So many of us have studied physics and the university of law, universal law of gravitation says the gravitational force between two objects is proportional to the product of the masses. And it could be the earth times my mass divided by the square of the distance between the centers. Now there are other ways of wording it. And in my classes, it was an equation with a gravitational constant that's one of the big three in physics. And I would get the students to work out what would the force be between a 50 kilogram girl and a 70 kilogram guy separated by 30 centimeters. And they busily would use it. And they regretted taking physics because it's only like a millionth of a Newton. So this force is very small for everything's, uh, everyday things. Um, 
Anyway, this relationship also allows the relative mass of any object with a satellite to be calculated. And the distance to the moon and its period was known then. And through telescopes and uh, illuminated reticles, they could work out the radius of the orbit of Io. And the period could be worked out by many observations. And just from that information, you know the, the mass of Jupiter is about 315 times the mass of Earth. But neither the mass nor density of Earth was known, which means you couldn't find the density of Jupiter, which tells us something about what's in it. Surface rocks are something like two and a half times water. What's the whole Earth? That was the experiment. And Newton wondered if a mountain could deflect a plumb line, but didn't think it could be measured until Neville Maskelin. He's another giant and also the villain of Davis Soville's wonderful book, Longitude. And in 1761, there was a transit of Venus uh, visible from St. Helena. And he suggested, why don't we also get a certain type of telescope that looks straight up and see if Sirius over a year moves compared to the other stars. And that would be conclusive proof that the Earth does go around the sun because some people still argued about that. The main argument being, why don't the stars move as we have a year? Anyway, he um, enjoyed looking at clouds during the transit, but he tried to measure how Sirius uh, moved in the sky and the instrument wasn't consistent and he did experiments to figure out what the problem was. And in a dramatic meeting of the Royal Society, he showed what the problem was and suggested an improvement. And that's a problem that most of these instruments had before. Maybe because of that, at age 33, he was appointed the Astronomer Royal. And that is quite an important position in Britain in charge of the Greenwich Observatory, making sure the balls drop at the right time for navigation, etc. Um, among other things, he also organized the Transit of Venus expeditions for 1769 uh, and poor Captain Cook had to go to spend a few months at Tahiti rather than enjoy the wonderful Arctic winter that Wales and Diamond did near uh, Churchill. Anyway, the results turned out, including those two good observations and the average distance to the sun was calculated a couple of years later within a percent or two. The next year, he proposed an experiment to measure the weight of the earth by measuring the effect on a mountain. And he started a committee of attraction, which included Benjamin Franklin from the United States. The committee figured the mountain had to be high enough, about uh, a Monroe 3,000 feet or uh, about a kilometer. It had to be detached from other mountains, which make the list Lake District Mountains not suitable. A ridge, if there is one, roughly east-west, and it has to be in the kingdom of His Majesty King George III, who helped provide the money. The committee hired Charles Mason to do uh, go up to Scotland and Northern England, and he's the one that surveyed the Mason-Dixon line in uh, six years earlier. And he recommended, and it was accepted, to pick Shehalian Mountain that is exactly in the center, geographical center of Scotland. This is a map from a report uh, a few years later. <clears throat> and in those days, they showed elevation by shading the sides of the mountain to show it steep. But this hill is a lot less tall than that hill. So it has limited work, but the ridge goes roughly east-west. Now, here comes the idea behind the experiment. If a plumb line or a weight at the bottom of a thin wire is deflected, then there's some angle and that angle is going to show earth gravity goes down, the mountain gravity goes sideways, and then the angle that ended up being about six arc seconds <clears throat> per side shows that earth gravity is something like 30,000 times stronger than mountain gravity. And from that, they can calculate it. But how do you measure that accuracy of this thing bending? I want to do a side trip into latitude. 
It's defined as the angle between horizontal and the celestial pole. And if somebody wants, I can explain a little bit more what horizontal meant. This is rather subtle. So if you measure a celestial pole as being 56.7 degrees above the horizon, <clears throat> that means you're on that latitude. But just as longitude and latitude give the east, west, and north, south location on Earth, right ascension and declination give the comparable values for um, stars. And a star at declination of 56.7 degrees will be exactly overhead from that latitude. Pitlochry's a really wonderful town that I drove through on the way from central Scotland to Loch Ness and other things in the north of Scotland. It happens to have a store that uh, has my family name on it and I bought a nice jacket from them. It's exactly east of the mountain and has latitude 56.7 degrees north. If you have a telescope that can look straight up compared to some line that hangs straight down, that star will be directly overhead. But if it's deflected by a mountain, now the star is not overhead. And it turns out what they did is they put a station on the south side of the mountain or an observing site and another one on the north side of the mountain and they compared the effects and that's how they measured this incredibly small angle two and a half centuries ago. So they picked two observatory sites starting in the south and they hired uh, people to dig it away to make a flat area. This was dug by hand. I'm not sure how they made the soil solid enough to hold astronomical equipment because you don't want it to move over the months. Um, and the north site. Now, Masculine <clears throat> Astronomer Royal was supposed to stay in London to make sure everything worked right. And he was used to hobnobbing in the Royal Court. Uh, he asked uh, Charles Mason to do the experiment, but Mason said no. Uh, he wondered about somebody else and then he got special permission to do the observation. So he spent four months in a bothy that was made near each of the sites. Now, this is just a small hut. Uh, this is made out of rocks, but there don't seem a pile of rocks at either of the sites from people that went there. So it must have been wood. And he lived there for four months. This is a picture from an expedition to Ecuador uh by a french group and uh they chose to hire an artist to show how the observation was done uh it just so seems wrong while you're right in the middle of an observation to have a door open with wind blowing in but that's the uh artists now i want to talk about this information this instrument that's called the zenith sector it looks straight overhead and it measures the angle between exactly overhead and a star when it passes from the east part of the sky over the meridian, which runs from due south to the zenith and back to due north towards the west part of the sky. So you only have one chance every day to measure a particular star. So the person here looks through the eyepiece. Um, the crosshairs are illuminated by a candle that uh, is here and there's a little diagonal mirror to reflect light down and he follows it. Now, these instruments only looked at a small patch of sky. So what they had to do is look at the charts of stars and say, the next one we can see is gonna be three degrees south of um, uh, overhead. So they've got to point this to the right direction and somebody else looks at the clock and says, okay, we're close. And then they only look for a short period of time. It's not like the person spends uh, all night long looking up. This drawing, this is the most important feature. And from the very top of the pivot of the telescope, they had a plumb line that ran all the way down and uh, they measured the angle from there. The one used at Chehalion was different. It was 10 feet. It was made for St. Helena, Masculine found the problem, designed a solution. This was done on this and he used it on the mountain. It was returned, but to my knowledge, never used again and no picture or sign of it anymore. But there's another instrument of this type and there were typically three to five instruments like this at any given era. And this was made in 1727. 
they measured aberration and nutation with it, which are two phenomena I wasn't that much aware of. It's um, because it was sent to South Africa at that year, they decided to hire an artist to make good pictures. And fortunately, I can show them. And it gives a sense of how these instruments are used, because that's what I'm trying to convey is the incredible effort to uh, measure the cosmos and all the little details that had to be right. Anyway, this is 12 feet tall and all Xena sectors swing north south from the top and it has to be exactly aligned and uh, masculine got it within uh, an arc minute. The eyepiece at the bottom to look at the star is at the bottom and this happens to be pulled all the way to the left but it also can go all the way to the right. Um, the key thing here is the green arrow shows where the plumb line went. And I'm going to show expanded views of those uh, in a bit. Um, this is the optical tube and the angle arc is fixed to it. And the back arc is connected to the frame of the telescope and their little screws that could tighten it. It can swing back and forth and then you tighten it and hold position. The actual arch with the measurements in the 1832 one was calibrated every five arc minutes and there was a gold dot at each one. Now I find the artist was not exactly consistent like that gap there seems smaller than that gap but that doesn't matter for the art but it did for the actual manufacturer the incredible accuracy to get each of the dots in exactly the right place it just so amazes me. Unfortunately, when the first one, when the, the one uh, masculine used was made, you couldn't make arcs in degrees um, because they didn't know how to divide a circle until uh, a dividing engine was invented by Mas uh, Ramson, they couldn't do it. So he had a different scale and each division was about three and a, three and a third arc, uh, arc seconds, uh, a little bit smaller and he just counted and then converted later. Now, this is the microscope that looked at where the plumb line that goes all the way from the top and comes down uh, crosses the angle arc. Uh, it's some sort of a pot and some of these had a liquid to reduce, uh, uh, to dampen the swings. I have no idea how this is illuminated because this was done at night. You couldn't have a uh, a candle in front of it because the moving air would disturb the accuracy of the measurement. Uh, you couldn't have a candle to one side and then the plumb line wouldn't get centered. Perhaps what they did is had a candle that mounted on top. I don't know, but somehow this had to be illuminated to be seen. So masculine would, after finishing an observation, writing everything down, he would select the next star, push the tube, to close to the expected angle, tighten the screws. There are actually two, but one is hidden behind. Then while holding this micrometer that can adjust it, turn the micrometer as he looked through this and to line the, uh, the uh, uh, plumb line to exactly go over one of those gold dots. Then after doing something else, he would observe the target star when it was predicted to be close to exactly on. And the difference in turns was recorded. And that's the measurement. Except, I said I would talk about the problem with the 19, uh, 1761 Zenith sector. This is a sketch by Maskelyne to illustrate the problem. How most of these instruments back then, they had a structure like this with um, uh, cylinders that come out and it hangs on that. That's the pivots that have to be exactly east-west. And one of them was turned down a little bit and then enlarged like two cones meeting each other. And they had a plumb line that hung from it. And after his experiments, he realized that the plumb line wasn't slipping consistently. So he came up with a design that probably got him to be selected as Astronomer Royal. This is a sketch from the 1832 model, and this is the top of the telescope. I don't know if they had uh, dew shields or maybe had a cover that was on it when they weren't actually observing because they don't want it to get um, uh, dewed up. 
And these are the pivots that hold the telescope. And they are oriented exactly east-west. This is a solution. I took the previous image and reversed it, flipped it here, by the way. And there was a gold dot on that pivot point. Then they took this piece and slipped it on and they removed the covers and they put it that this V notch held that pivot and this V notch held the other and then they put the covers back on. Once it got hung from the top, this structure sat on, a, on a, the top mount. Um, once they got it on the top, what happens is the astronomer for every observation would climb up, use a microscope like here, and he would look at how the plumb line here matched the dot on the pivot, and he would move it back and forth so it was exactly in line. Then he would have to go back down and re place the, um, uh, to the exact spot, and then he would um, time it to be able to observe the star. The, um, this instrument normally sat in a wall in um, uh, the Greenwich Observatory, but when it was out in the field, they had to make some wooden structure like this, and given that people had to climb up, there had to be a second structure for climbing, and I sort of think of masculine in a windy night that's still clear, so he wants to observe, climbing up this thing, somehow balancing to be able to hold a light to look to the exact um, position of the plumb line uh, without dropping it and lighting a fire to the whole thing. The concentration that he had to have to uh, do all this observation over four months was rather incredible. Anyway, this structure allowed um, the actual telescope fit in these pivots here. And after he did about a month of observations on one side with the pivot to the east side, if this is north, then they turned it around 180 degrees, lined it up again exactly to um, the uh, north-south direction, and then sighted the same stars again. And the only thing he recorded was um, the, uh, the actual dot location. So here it would be 25 arc minutes, whatever the number of degrees is. And then the number of micrometer turns to get to uh, the crosshairs. So what he then did is he would record things down and this got into his paper. So this is for the star 33 Cygni, like uh, this is sorted by RA. So uh, they were all like these were a bunch from Cygnus. He went 14 of his divisions south. That's about three quarters of a degree south. And on July 24th, he turned the micrometer north by one full turn and 0.2 parts that are about an arc second. On the 26th, a little more, 29th, a little more, and the 31st, it was all one turn plus 3.1 there. Then it was turned, and I don't know how, but in one day, he was able to get it turned and all aligned again. And this time, it was north with no turns, but 30 uh, parts, and he was able to get four observations there. Um, once he finished doing both sides and that eliminated uh, errors in the thing, then the whole works was carried up over the mountain and back down again. So they must have brought up the wooden crates that held everything that has to be at least 10 feet long, packed it up, took that structure apart in about two weeks to do all that. And I've talked to Boyd Harris, or emailed Boyd Harris and also Karen Rand who also has been in the site and some of the rocks are loose and it's very tricky to walk on that site. Fortunately, everything worked out. It got to the north and then poor Masculine spent another two months observing from there. In four months, with much bad weather, Masculine made 337 observations of 43 stars. And the conclusion of part one 
is he found that the result after adjustments for aberration and nutation and all sorts of other things was 54.6 arc seconds, the precision from two and a half centuries ago. That's the difference in angle of stars between the north and south. Part of it was the latitude difference, but part was clearly attraction of the mountain. And that was proof that all matter has some gravitational attraction. Now, I have a lot to continue telling you about the second half of the experiment and how they finally got a density of the earth and how it was used. And uh, this gives you a sense of some of the things. So I'll continue it next month. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ron. The ingenuity way back then is just amazing. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. And uh, we look forward to your uh, second part, which will be at the uh, uh, September uh, 8th meeting. All right, do we have any questions for Ron? We do have one comment from Eric. <clears throat> Starlight from a Zenith telescope can also be slightly deflected by the aberration of light. I'm not sure if that deflection would be more or less than a plumb bomb defect deflection from a mountain. Um, aberration of light, I want to make an analogy to what it is. Um, it's because the Earth moves at 30 kilometers a second in its orbit and light moves 10,000 times faster. And our motion compared to light can actually be detected and it was first detected by the uh, 1827, or sorry, 1727 uh, instrument that I showed all those detailed pictures of. I'll give an analogy to what causes it. Let's say you're in um, a flat area on a road where there are no trees, it's just open farmland, and the wind is blowing from the side with snow. So the snow comes straight from beside you. But if you start finishing the stop sign and progressing forward against the wind, suddenly the snow, instead of seeming to come straight from the side, seems to come a little closer towards you and if you drive really fast it seems to be coming straight towards you even though compared to the earth it's moving sideways and that's the effect that causes aberration and it was adjusted for by various procedures that were talked about but i didn't get into and it's about 20 arc seconds and it's most common in stars that are south at midnight so we're moving one way. It's the light from stars that are across that are the biggest factor. And it turns out that stars on the ecliptic, and it's all the stars in that area, it's not like one, they move back and forth, the stars on the ecliptic, but stars 90 degrees to the ecliptic move in a circle and it's about 20 arc seconds across and it can be measured and it had to be adjusted, okay? Awesome. And we have another question from Eric. The deviation caused by the aberration of light is much smaller than the aberration caused by deviation from plumb caused by the mountain. What was your number again? 20 arc seconds. Oh, the mountain was 56. And the um, uh, aberration of light is something like uh, 20 arc seconds. But again, it was adjusted for in terms of the different months and the procedure. Anyway, keep going. And that's all the questions we have. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, if I can just mention one more small thing, and I'm going to post it to the Toronto uh, Center email group. Um, the Outreach uh, Education Public Outreach Committee is running a workshop on processing Mars picks and more. And what you can do is there's a program and you can get a simple version for free or pay for a better one. And you can actually download raw images that come right from Perseverance. And what you do is uh, you can process them and you might be able to see a picture before maybe anybody else has looked at it in detail and maybe find something. This is an example of citizen science and it could be fun. Anyway, I'll post this to the Toronto Centre um, email group, but uh, it is um, um, 
uh, going to be an interesting program, and I'm signed up on uh, August 26th, uh, 20, 29th. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and keep safe and look forward to observing soon with other people. Great, thank you so much, uh, Ron. I know it takes a long time to prepare all that information and slides.